Mark 4, verse 35 to 41, and it reads, <coughs> On the day when evening had come, he told them, Let's cross over to the other side of the sea. So they left the crowd and took him along since he was in the boat, and other boats were with him. A great storm arose, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so the boat was already being swamped. He was in the stern sleeping on the cushion, so they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we are going to die? He got up, he rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Silence, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Then he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked one another, Who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. This is the reading of God's word. Amen. Thank you so much, Mike. Much appreciated. Thanks, Vanessa, for hosting as well. Thank you, Jake and Lasejo, for leading as well. Thank you, everyone, for a rapper of a question of the day today. That went well, I have to say. The kids were awesome. Uh, we are in the Gospel of Mark. So you guys just saw that. Chapter 4. I'm loving Mark at the moment. Uh, anyone else loving Mark at the moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my iPad isn't working this morning either, so two generators down and the iPad down. Loving it. I'm going to preach from my mobile phone. It's going to be fun. Teens, if you're a teenager, then go. <laughs> Please, uh, everyone from our teen ministry, you guys are welcome to follow Jake there to uh, the room across the square. Nice one, guys. Enjoy it. I remember my first job in ministry was as teen youth worker. I didn't know what it entailed. But the pastor said to me, do you want to come and work for us? And I said, yes. And he said, cool, do you want to work with teens? And I said, yeah. What do we do? Play frisbee, eat, talk about Jesus, go on camps. And he's like, yeah, just about that. And I mean, boom, I'm in. Our teen group is growing uh, quite well. I like that. Okay. Guys, loving Mark at the moment. How about you guys? Are you reading it? Are you following along? Great, I'm glad to hear that. So when I planned this sermon series, I decided that I'm going to preach Mark 4.35 all the way through to the end of chapter 5 today. I had a great theme. The theme was called Courageous Compassion. It's catchy. It's alliterated. And I thought that I'm just going to walk you through the text. Then on Monday morning, I woke up and I had my time of silence and prayer. And I started reading the whole portion again. And I decided that I'm going to preach Mark 5, verse 1 to 20. Um, it's, a, it's the longest exorcism we have in the Bible. So I decided, let me tackle the issue of evil, of Satan, of demons, of exorcism. And let me talk about the nature of evil, the power of evil, the pattern of evil. How do we get liberated from evil? Like I was all ready on Monday afternoon to preach the text. Then on Tuesday morning at 5.57, I was coming down Alexandra Road. I just exited Irene, sun shining on my back because sunrise was around 5.41 that morning. And as I was running, I felt God say to me, I'm not going to preach Mark 5. I am going to preach Mark 4, 35 to 41. And I went, okay. So just the night before, the Spirit told me to do something, and I didn't do it. That's called sin. So when I woke up on Tuesday morning, I had my time of silence, and I usually start my time of silence with, how did I go to bed? Like, what happened last night? How do I feel this morning? And I went, oh, snap. God told me to do something, and I didn't do it. So I started with repentance there. That was before my run. Then I went for my run, and in my run, God says, you'll be preaching Mark 4. And I go, okay. I said no last night, and that didn't go well. <laughs> so what I'll do now is I'll just say yes. And in the space of about two to 400 meters, I felt God say to me, I have something to teach you. So what I'm about to teach to you this morning is what God taught me this week. And I'm really, really excited about it. Fam, growing and progressing and transforming is hard. Anyone? Set out a goal? You know that you need to do stuff to get there. And at some point, it becomes a grind. You guys know me as a runner. So I know in a month's time, March, 
April and May starts. It's the worst time of the comrades training season because nothing is fun anymore. I'm more tired, more hungry, more lonely the whole time. I run further and further. I'm more fatigued in my body. It's less enjoyable. It gets light later. It gets colder. Like there's nothing nice about that phase of the comrade season. But I know that I have to push through that to achieve the goal on the 9th of June. You guys know what I mean? And I mean, it's the same with any process of growth and transformation. Let me be honest with you. Sometimes it's hard to be a follower of Jesus. Sometimes it's hard to be a follower of Jesus. And this teaching text tells us of a time when it was really hard for the disciples. And if it was hard for them, it'll be hard for us. And then in this time of extreme hardship, Jesus asks them this question that has worked with me this whole week, and that is, why are you afraid? Fam, I've tried probably 20 to 30 times to see if we can translate this question in a different way. You can't. That's literally what Jesus asks them. Why are you afraid? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever pondered that question? I have this whole week, and this teaching text will help us to ponder that question in our time here today. Last thing that I want to say before I pray is this text is so dense, hold on to your seats, that I have no points today. Would you believe that? Always three, at least, sometimes four sometimes six, and then you guys wonder how long we are going to be here. This text is so dense, I have no points. Because it's really about the power of Jesus and the way that the disciples respond to it. That's what this whole portion of Scripture is about. So here's what we're going to do today. We are going to work through this bad boy line by line, word by word. Okay? And it's going to be awesome. So all the Bible nerds in the house just went, whoop, 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 whoop. Everyone else who's not necessarily Bible nerds just went, oh, how am I going to follow him? Power of Jesus and the frightening experience of the disciples. Like that's your two anchors to hold on to. Are you with me? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I was moved during worship this morning, um, proclaiming, singing, confessing what we believe about you. And we could keep going, Lord Jesus, because that is how awesome and all-powerful and all-knowing you are. You saved each one of us here today. Those of us who are not saved, I know that you keep on pursuing us. You want to be in a relationship with us. And Lord Jesus, I know that through the scripture today, you're looking all of us in the proverbial eye, asking us, why are you afraid? So, Lord Jesus, as we work through the Scripture now, I pray that you would anoint my lips, have me say only the things that you want me to say. Work in us. Transform us. All for your glory, Lord Jesus. We pray that in your name. Amen. <coughs> Let's go to the Sea of Galilee. I've got a few photos for you guys. I am now going to close the windows because you won't be able... Ach, not close the windows, sorry. Close the curtains. You guys won't be able to see the photos. How's that? Yeah? The Sea of Galilee, fam. This is the other side. That's how our text starts. That is also the woman that I'm married to, my wife Marie. So we went there in November of 2014. Our scripture reading starts with the words, When evening had come, Jesus said, Let's cross over to the other side. That's the other side. The Golan Heights. I'll say something about that now. So we went to the Sea of Galilee. It was a marvelous experience. And then we were like, hey, we might just as well go on a boat on the Sea of Galilee. So we went on a boat. There's a photo of uh, the boat and a guy showing us a fishing net and how they would cast nets. That was quite great. And then, would you believe it, on the boat, a storm came up. So I've got a photo of that as well. There you go. Uh, Rudolf just won back quickly. Do you see the sun? Do you see it? Do you see it? Okay, Rudolf, next one, please. Sun gone. All of a sudden, storm on the Sea of Galilee. It happens. I'll say something about that now. What a 
crazy experience, right? At that time, my hair looked like a soccer ball. I had really short hair, and I could even feel that air going in the wind. After the storm passed, we went to go and see a museum, and then we saw this. Can you guys see the rainbow? A rainbow. Hello, Genesis 9. When you see the bow in the clouds, you'll know of my covenantal love, which means that I'll never destroy you again. Fam, like that was us. Can you see the storm passing over the seas? Yeah. And then we went to a museum where they showed us a boat that they actually dug up from the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, and it looked like that. So if you're curious to know the size, that boat was probably from here to the piano. That's how big the boat was. So that was a common size boat for the first century. Do you guys have a, a picture in your head now of where all of this happened? Cool. Let me show you our discipleship journey quickly as well while we're busy looking at pictures. This is our discipleship journey. We say a disciple loves God and loves people. And we say a disciple loves God through knowing Him. A disciple knows God. A disciple commits faithfully. And a disciple gives generously. That is how we love God and love people. So I want you to see that today we are going to be in the faithful commitment corner of our discipleship journey. And I think this teaching text will once again amplify the fact that a disciple disciple commits faithfully to transformation, the change of the Holy Spirit inside of you, and also that a disciple commits faithfully to the mission of the church. So that's where we'll um, focus our attention today. All right, let's look at the teaching text. I'm going to put it on the slide for you, and we are going to work it through slowly. On that day, which day? Do you guys remember in the beginning of Mark chapter 4, Jesus started teaching. There was a massive crowd of people, so Jesus taught from a boat on the water, speaking to the crowds. The whole day, no amps, no head mics, talking about the kingdom. Do you guys remember? He taught them many parables. He never spoke without a parable, it said. And he was teaching them about the kingdom because that is what he came to announce. When evening had come, he said to them, let's cross over to the other side of the sea. Okay, so we've got four professional fishermen who knows that sea like the palm of their hands. Remember now, Jesus grew up in Nazareth. Nazareth wasn't at the sea. So of all the skills Jesus had, being a fisherman wasn't one of them. He's got four springbok fishermen on his team at the moment. They are on that lake Every single day. They know when to go on the lake. They also know when to not go on the lake. They've seen many, many storms. That day when we boarded that boat, I mean, it was kind of a running joke in our tour group. <laughs> Will there be a storm? And the guy went, yeah, the wind's picking up on the Gola Nights. Let's go. And we went, whoa, because they know the signs. They know when a storm would come. What's on the other side? Pagans and pigs. Not my people, not my place. Why on earth, after a long day of ministry, do we have to go there? Because when we go there, we will be unclean. Which means when we come back, we are going to have to go through a cleansing ritual first, before I can kiss my wife. You know what I mean? Why on earth do we have to go there now? Did the disciples ask that question? We don't know. So I think this is a tick box for the disciples because they just obeyed. Just think about that. I don't know about you guys, but many times when I see a storm brewing, I feel compelled to just warn Jesus about that. You know, Because I've got a skill set now, don't I? I know what's going on. I know what lies ahead for us. So I think if I was a disciple in that way, I would have gone, Jesus, listen, very appreciative. Why don't we just park the bus here and then tomorrow morning we'll cross because the weather is picking up. Four spring box. They said nothing. And they got on the boat and they went to the other side full of pigs and pagans. Usually a Jewish person would never go there. Why, do Jesus why did Jesus take them there? Because the gospel is meant for them too. The kingdom is for everyone. 
Do you guys remember the triangle said a disciple commits faithfully to the mission of the church? This is the disciples committing faithfully to the mission of Jesus. They could have gone many other places around the Sea of Galilee. Jesus went, Golanites, Decapolis, ten towns, let's go. And they did. Then it says in verse 36, they left the crowd and took him along since he was in the boat. And other boats were with him. Have you ever seen that line? It's like it jumped out at my eyes. They weren't the only boat in the storm. They also weren't the only boat that witnessed the silencing of the storm. People were so hungry to see and to hear, even they were willing to cross over. Think about this. You've got four springboks in the boat going, there's a storm brewing. And then you've got a host of other people going, we don't care about the storm. Jesus is brilliant. We don't want to miss out on this. Right? A great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. Okay. No surprise about the windstorm. The Sea of Galilee is below sea level. I just showed you guys photos of the Golan Heights, which is a mountain range. And only 30 kilometers north from the Sea of Galilee, there's Mount Hermon, which is high above sea level. So you've got high sea level, below sea level, and that drop in altitude creates, I feel like a weatherman, a high pressure system to the north, and then a cut off low pressure system on the southeast, which will lead to torrential rain. Okay? So just like uh, uh, weather would be explained on our telly today, that's exactly what happened there. So they weren't surprised that the great windstorm arose. And then Mark adds this detail that the waves were breaking over the boat. Now we need to pause there. That's actually a really important piece of detail. In the biblical times, people believed that the creation had three levels. A flat earth, one colossal disk with sides. The mighty, beautiful blue expanse, also called the heavens. And then the place of death or Sheol or whatever was down bottom. And they believed that the sea was a gateway to go to Sheol, right? Or the place of death. So either you were going to sail on the sea and then drop off the side to Sheol, or the sea was going to swallow you, right, from, uh, what do we say? From below. Either the sea, or, yeah, or the sea was going to swallow you from below and take you to Sheol, right? That's how people thought about it. So in the first century, no one could tame the waters, and the waters were deemed to be the place where evil would be brewing. Okay? Right. Now we see that the waves were breaking over the boat, and the boat was being swamped. So in their head, it's busy sinking, but it's not only waves coming over the boat, it's evil forces. Forces from the kingdom of death, busy spilling into our boat, pulling us down, right? That's what happened to them according to their own understanding. Okay. Now, in verse 38, it says he was in the stern. If this was the front of the boat, then Jesus was lying in the back. And it says he was sleeping on the cushion. So they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? How's that for waking him up? Huh? Not... Pst, Jesus, teacher, Jesus. No, they came in with a shout. Okay, so let's just, let's just pause there for a minute. Firstly, what a beautiful picture of the humanity of Jesus, right? Jesus was a human and he was God, both at the same time. This is one of the times that we see his humanity. Preaching the whole day, getting onto the boat, and what the text doesn't say, but what is implied by the text, is Jesus left this job to them. Isn't that just beautiful? You guys are the pro. You know how to get us to the other side. My body battery is very low. I had a long day. I'm just going to take a nap. Start nap. Boop, bleep. No, Jesus didn't have a garment. I'm just joking. 
And then Jesus works the deep sleep cycles in such a way that he doesn't even wake up. A good old rest with his life in the hands of his disciples. It's a beautiful picture now, isn't it? Okay. The disciples see the storm come up. What do you guys think they did? They tried to navigate the storm. Why? Because they can. Why? Because they have the skills. Why? Because they believed that they could do it in their own strength. They believed that they could depend on their own skills. That's why they didn't wake Jesus up earlier. So they got a tick in the beginning of the teaching text, but definitely getting a little cross now. Because if you think about it, if we would just pause the story like this, it was very possible for the disciples to say, guys, we are in trouble. Let's wake up Jesus and ask him for help. Jesus, we are in trouble. A great storm arose. Please help us. That could have been their way of, uh, of reacting to it. But they didn't. Because I know. I know what to do next. I've got this, you know. I could even see a little rivalry between the two sons of thunder and Peter and his brother going, no, don't go that way. Water over the side. Take this rope. Throwing it and pulling stuff. And I mean, Philip, the lover of horses, going, I wish I was on my horse right now. You know what I mean? Like there were other disciples in their boat just doing nothing. They depended on their own strength and their own skills. Have you ever been there? My marriage is really struggling. But I'm okay. I know how to fix this. My finances is in a dire strait. But at least I can work a spreadsheet. So I know. Someone is really sick. But at least they have great health care. A relationship is really strained. But at least we can still sit around the same table. You guys see it? I can carry on, fam, for ages. Because this is one of our most sinful responses, is when the storm comes, we batten down the hatches and we believe that we have the skills to pull it through. And then all of a sudden, when the storm got out of hand, they shouted at Jesus. Who wakes up with a shout in the morning? Anyone. I mean, it's not a great space to wake up with, you know? So now they lose control. You guys see it? They are staring death in the face. They are panicking massively, big scale. And then the resentment sets in. Why did we have to come over the lake in the evening? And then they throw a tantrum and then they call on Jesus. Anyone? Why am I in this place? Why am I struggling? I'm a faithful follower of Jesus. I said yes to him, and now things are tough. And then you throw your toys, and then you go, Jesus, help me, I'm dying. Why do we do that? Why? Well, the disciples did it too. So there's a little bit of comfort there to go, listen, the 12 guys who changed the world, they made the same mistake. Yes, I'm in good company. That is true. But fam, we have to read this text, and we have to learn from it, and not make the same mistakes. They willingly committed to this because they got in the boat. Our discipleship journey says a disciple commits faithfully. You do it willingly. And when the going gets tough, resenting someone else and throwing a tantrum will not help you. Comrades 2012, I saw Marie on 59 kilometers. And when I saw her, I was toast. I just knew I can't continue the race. And I came up to her and I went, <laughs> Lovey, I can't, I can't, I'm done. And my coach stood right next to her. So Marie did what a woman filled with empathy does. She just cried with me. And then I said to my coach, Coach, I can't, I'm done. Do you know what he said? He said, I know. Takes me around the shoulder and he says, let's walk a little bit. I know what you're going through, he says to me. You didn't drink enough. You didn't eat enough. You dehydrated and you're tired. Here's what we're going to do now. And we just kept on walking. Have this sandwich. Holds me while I eat the sandwich. <laughs> Have this drink. 
holds me while I drink something, and then he went, all right, so there you go. See you at the end. And then he turned around. I walked for an hour and 30 minutes, and then all of a sudden my energy came back to me because I was dehydrated and I didn't eat enough. And then I started running again. I had a little Nokia phone with me, called Marie, love it. <laughs> I'm running again, boop. And then I just went for it. But in that moment, I resented the whole world for the fact that I was going through a rough patch. And the only thing my coach did is he was like, you signed up for this. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Fam, the same principle counts for us as disciples of Jesus. Resentment and tantrums and then shouting at Jesus is not the way. Calling on Jesus for help earlier is the way. What does that ask for? The old H word? Humility. The disciples failed the humility test here. And then they got themselves into a position where they were screaming and shouting. I mean, that is, that's why I shouted over the microphone. It's not, teacher, don't you care that we are going to die? That's not how it was. We're talking about a boat that's being swamped. We're talking about wind and waves. He got up, verse 39. He rebuked the wind. And he said to the sea, that's important, both wind and sea, silence, be still. And then they mention wind and then the sea again in great calm. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. Any magic formulas? Any burning of incense calling on the spirits? Nothing. Any special formulas in the name of? Nothing. Fam, do you know what I tell my kids? Sit and play no still. Play still. Sit and keep quiet. And stay quiet. Jesus talks to the wind and the seas like you talk to a kid. Not even a match for him. Fam, ooh, I've got goose flesh running down my neck. Just think about that. No struggle, no issue. Be quiet, stay quiet. That's it. And then it says, the wind ceased and there was a great calm. That word great calm in Greek is mega calm. It means that it, was a, it was a mega calm, a colossal calm, like calmer than we've known. Now why is that important? Because the wind could sometimes just die down. And then people could have said, oh well, it wasn't a miracle. Sometimes the wind just dies down. You guys have seen that. Does the waves in the sea or in a big lake like that ever just go, whew. it doesn't. It keeps on crashing and it keeps on coming. And in an instant, like a moment, everything went. Can you guys imagine what that must have been like? My word. Like I often think when we are in eternity one day, we will be shown replays of history, like all the good stuff. This is one of the things that I want to see. Oh, Jesus, show us, show us that day. I want to hear your Mufasa voice go, silence! You know what I mean? Like, I, I can't imagine what his voice must have sounded like. But just imagine now, tired disciples doing something that they knew, knew was going to be challenging, on their way to pagans and pigs, because they believe in this message of the kingdom, feeling so threatened that they actually shout, we are going to die, all of a sudden, calm seas. No wind. Fam. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, I, I don't think, it, it's indescribable. I don't think there are words to describe it. 
So this man has authority over everything that is scary, that is dark, and that is wild. Think about this. This man has infinite power, massive power, supernatural power, unmanageable power. Do you guys see the disciples here? We can't control the storm, and we can't control Jesus. Do you guys see it? That's like a double humility punch. Because they thought that they could control the storm, and then they couldn't. And then they thought that they'd control Jesus, and then He did something that absolutely blew their imagination in a way that's completely different from what, from what they wanted Him to do. And then they go, oh snap, we really are small now, aren't we? We really are lowly humans compared to this God-man standing with us in the boat. Why is this important? Just a quick side note. Have you guys ever heard of the Apocrypha? Also, writings, ancient writings, that we say adds on to the biblical narrative and gives us some historical detail. So there's a book called Maccabees. In Maccabees, there was a Roman leader. He was an actual historical figure. His name was, how do I pronounce it? Antiochus Epiphanes. Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes, if I pronounce it in Afrikaans. He claimed that he could calm the seas. And it's written down in Maccabees that the religious leaders replied to him and said, Blasphemy! Blasphemy! Only God can silence the seas. Who silenced the seas here? Jesus. You don't have to have an A grade in math to know that that equals that Jesus is God. And these Jewish boys knew that story because it was such a blasphemous claim that the only person that can make this claim is God himself. Let's look at verse 14. Then he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? I wish that Jesus said more. But he didn't. So I actually don't wish that he said more. Because that's the question now, isn't it? Like, deal with this. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Fam, I can't answer that question for you. But that's surely a question that you have to answer yourself. Today's teaching text puts that before us. After this unbelievably colossal, beautiful, supernatural miracle, the question to each of us is, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? In Greek, you can actually translate the last question as, where is your faith? Which is a good question, because where is your faith? If I ask you, where is your faith, then that implies that you should be able to show your faith. And how do we show our faith? By stepping out in faith. And following the leading of the Holy Spirit without knowing the end result and without controlling the end result. And without controlling this journey of stepping out in faith. That's what Jesus asks them. Where is your faith? The book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11, colossal chapter on faith. It says in verse 1, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for. The proof of what is not seen. Let's work it back. It's not seen, but there's proof of it. That's faith. I said that earlier about our church's finances. If you look at our spreadsheet, you can't see God's provision. But we have proof of God's provision by faith. That's how it works, fam. Let's work it one back. It's the things... Hoped for, but living as if it's a reality. 
the reality of what is hoped for. Why is this so important? Because Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. Without faith it is impossible to please God since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So this question of Jesus is one of the questions in the Gospel of Mark. So whether you've journeyed along for the full five weeks so far or today is your first Mark sermon, this is a massive moment. And if I preached what I wanted to preach, we would have missed this. Isn't it just beautiful, <laughs> right? Like God had on his heart that all of us should collectively deal with these two questions. I would not have preached this portion of scripture. But that's the question to all of us today. Do you guys know how faith works? God gives us the gift of faith. Then we take a hold of faith. We grip it. And then we take a leap of faith. That's how it works. So God gifts it. We take it, but the moment we take it, we have to take a leap of faith. Because God doesn't give us the full end result all in detail. Jesus says, follow me. And then he goes. That's why the disciples ended up here. Because they followed him. They were true to his first invitation and to their first commitment. That gift of faith is for every single person on earth. And we get to decide whether we grip it and take that leap of faith. That's what faith is. And without faith, we can't please God. Let's look at verse 41. Now, fam, you can laugh. This is really funny. Look at verse 41. The disciples were scared. <laughs> and then Jesus silences the storm. And then they're terrified. <laughs> Think about it. Like you read the scripture and you go, probably verse 41 is going to say, and they all laughed. They were filled with joy. They sung Waymaker. They posted, Woo! What a wild night on their Instagram feeds. They all gave each other a fist bump and a high five. No, 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 not these chaps. They were terrified. Jesus, we're scared, we gotta die. <coughs> Silence, be still. Now I'm even scared. <coughs> Why? And let me finish with this. Why? Because this was a disorienting exercise for them. They thought they knew, but they didn't. It was a humbling exercise for them. Because they wanted to do it on their own and they couldn't. And it was a reframing exercise for them. Because Jesus revealed something about himself that they had to deal with. He just showed them that he is superior in authority. Deal with that. You guys know after a sports game, usually... The losing captain goes, y'all know it was tough out there. You know, on Monday we'll go back to the drawing board. Have you guys heard sports captains say that? That's exactly what they had to do. Back to the drawing board, gents. You thought you knew, but you didn't. And now I revealed something about me that you have to deal with. And if this is who Jesus is, then we better get back in line and submit under his authority. That's why they were terrified. Because Jesus showed that they can't manage him and they can't control him. We can't control the storm. We can't control him. We are not in control. I am terrified. That's why it ended that way. And it ends with a question, who then is this? And then a witness, even the wind, and then again, the sea obey him. Do, do you ever talk to yourself? Anyone? Whew, you have to help me here because I do. I do. This is pretty much the disciples talking to themselves. Standing there in that boat. I want to believe that Jesus then gave a yawn and rubbed his eyes because he was in a deep sleep cycle. You know what I mean? Like got up to action, let it all settle, and then probably went, How far are we? And the disciples went, who is this? Even the wind and the seas obey him. Philip sits there. Mm. 
making little horse sounds to emotionally regulate himself. You know what I mean? <laughs> Terrified. What a phenomenal story. I want to read one verse to you, and then I want to give us an opportunity to respond. Rochelle, if you can hear me, will you please just knock on the teen's door so that we can have Jake and Lasejo back? Thank you. Fam, this is a phenomenal story, but I want you to know that God is still in that position of authority. He still is Lord over the storm. He still has supreme authority. In Revelation, in chapter 4, John sees a gateway into heaven. Now, fam, if you want to do some slow, deep reading and have your mind blown about what waits for us, go and read Revelation 4. John says it all opened up, and it was overwhelming what I saw. Colors, light, sounds, confirmations from the Old Testament, life, looks like a new Eden. And then he says in 4 verse 6, something like a sea of glass similar to crystal, was also before the throne. A sea so still that it looks like glass. A sea so still that it looks like a mirror. A sea so still that it looks like crystal. A sea that is mega calm. He did it once, and that was enough for the sea to remain mega calm forever. Right? There's no backlash from his defeat of evil. There's no backlash from his authority over it. He's Lord of it all. That's what John said when he saw God on his throne. Isn't it just a phenomenal, phenomenal sight? That God, fam, if you are a Christian, lives inside of you now through his Holy Spirit. The one that can calm the seas. The one that sits on the throne with a sea like crystal in front of him. Why are you afraid? Do, do you still have no faith? Amen. Lesejo, I want to ask you guys to come up. Um, I want to give us an opportunity to respond. So I want to ask you to close your eyes. And I just want to ask you a few questions. And if any of those questions are a yes from your side, then let's respond in prayer and then in worship. I want to ask you, are you willing to cross over to the other side? Sometimes God calls us to do stuff that just doesn't make sense. And we think we know better. And we don't want to go to the pagans and the pigs. But this story asks that question of us. Are you willing to go to the other side? I also want to ask you, are you willing to humble yourself and to call on Him earlier? Are you willing to humble yourself and call on Him earlier? Are you willing to let Him calm the storm? Are you willing to let Him calm the storm? Are you willing to step out in faith and to trust Him? If that's you, just say, I am willing. I am willing. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, being your disciples um, is wild sometimes. And it's hard. And we struggle with perseverance. And we get scared. And we try and do things on our own. And we resent you. And we throw tantrums. And we get scared and then we get even more scared. But Lord Jesus, we are willing. 
we are willing to go where you want us to go. We'll cross over to the other side. We are willing to humble ourselves and to call on you. I know that this little family of yours, Lord Jesus, is heavy burdened. And there are so many storms raging around us. We're willing to humble ourselves and to call on you. We are willing to let you calm the storm. You did it once. We know that you can do it again. And we believe that it will be like that forever. With the sea like crystal in front of you. Lord Jesus, we're willing to step out in faith. And we're willing to trust you. Thank you for showing your immense power to us. By your spirit, we pray that you would just root this truth in our hearts. Let it dictate the way that we leave this building today and that we wake up tomorrow. All for your glory, Lord Jesus, the one with the supreme authority. We pray that in your name. Amen.